So last month there was a viral text message thread between a boomer mom and her millennial son that went viral after being posted on the subreddit r slash boomers being fools. I'll, um, I'll read some of it now so you can understand what it's about. It starts with the mom texting her son and she says, there's a great show on Netflix called How to Get Rich, Good Ideas. How goes it? Love you. The son replies, love you too. I have no interest in getting rich. I just want what you had in your life. Livable wages, healthcare, vacations, savings, retirement, able to pay for, able to pay for my child's higher education, home ownership. Mom replies in all caps, no, don't jump to conclusions. This guy helps you think about money in a different way and how to get out of debt, etc. Just watch a few episodes and see what I mean. He explains why home ownership is not always what it seems. The son then replies again, Mom, owning and affording a home simply by having it gains you wealth. Simply for nothing other than owning it, you gain wealth. You know with all this patty stuff, I'm thinking about getting a will. But why? I have nothing of value. My life financially comes down to a car, a motorcycle, and a few guitars. I literally do not qualify to have a will. Has to be over 75k in value. Nothing can change that other than a livable wage. I make $22 an hour. That's equal to $2.81 an hour in 1970. What were you making as a nurse in 1970? I bet it was more than $2.81. Google says it was $8 to $11. $8 an hour in 1970 is equal to $65 an hour today. So you had at the start of your career triple what I currently do. I just bought one meal at the grocery store for my family tonight, $75. I love you, I truly do, but you have zero frame of reference at all. You've had nothing but livable wages and everything you needed your entire adult life. I've never taken my family on vacation. I have zero savings for Dylan's college. I will never own a home. And if it's so bad, why don't you go back to renting? You can hand 70% of your earnings to another person and grow their wealth. Meanwhile, you'll gain nothing. In my lifetime, I've given over 250k to landlords and made them richer. Well, all I have gotten is poorer, gained zero wealth or equity. I'm fine with all of this. It is what it is. But don't call your poor friend in Mexico and complain about your air conditioner being broken. They live in a desert and they've never had air conditioning. Good night, mom. Love you. And by the way, I don't have any debt. Zero. And I still live paycheck to paycheck. Now, I want to make it clear. I didn't bring this up to epically all in all of his points in a column of grateful, as boomers tend to do. But I think his message reflects a common mythos that is believed by a lot of people my age. Richard Wolff is a socialist professor who I think makes one of the stronger cases for transitioning away from capitalism. He does a good job at putting his mythos into words. As he wrote for The Guardian, one aspect of American exceptionalism was always economic. U.S. workers, so the story went, enjoyed a rising level of real wages that afforded their families a rising standard of living. Ever harder work paid off an ever rising consumption. Then everything changed. Real wages stopped rising as U.S. capitalists redirected their investments to produce and employ abroad while millions of U.S. workers were being replaced with computers. In the U.S., capitalism stopped delivering the goods as it so long boasted. The reality of ever deeper economic division clashes with expectations built up when wages rose over the century before the 1970s. U.S. capitalism now brings long-term painful decline for its working class. Now, I would like to state that I share many of Wolf's concerns about the general nature of capitalism and especially about inequality. It is a tragedy that CEOs are paid over 300 times that of the average worker. It is a tragedy that nearly 600,000 Americans do not have homes. But if you said America's middle class is worse off than it was in the 70s or that millennials and Gen Z are uniquely predestined to remain poor simply do not appear to be borne out in our available data. Firstly, we should talk about the claim that real, meaning of inflation-adjusted wages, are stagnating. Here we have to start by explaining how we try to measure inflation. Listen, just stick with me. We have to do this to get to the interesting stuff. One of the ways we do this is by using a measure called the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. CPI measures the weighted average of price changes in a fixed basket of goods. The fixed basket means that CPI fails to capture anything outside of that basket of goods. If the price of a good in a basket increases, consumers may substitute buying that good for a good not in a basket. CPI doesn't account for this substitution. It assumes people keep buying the same things regardless of price changes. In the same vein, CPI doesn't account for new products on the market. 
When Blockbuster was outcompeting Netflix, consumers were getting a better product at the same or even cheaper price, but this type of deflation isn't represented in CPI. This is called substitution bias, and it is the first way CPI tends to overestimate inflation. CPI also doesn't account for changes in product quality. For instance, a new TV might have the same basic function of displaying video, but offer a much sharper picture, a better refresh rate, or better smart features compared to an older TV in the CPI basket. If the new, higher quality TV costs the same as the older one, the CPI wouldn't report any inflation, when really what has occurred here is deflation. You're getting a better product for the same price. This is the second way CPI tends to overestimate inflation. CPI also has an idiosyncratic way of measuring shelter prices, to put it mildly. Firstly, CPI weights the cost of shelter very high in this index, at 26.8%. This isn't a problem on its own. After all, shelter is probably the most expensive thing any given consumer is paying for in the regular. However, it is important to remember that if CPI is overestimating the cost of housing, that could end up having significant effects on the rest of the index. CPI measures what it calls owner's equivalent rent, which it calculates through a survey of homeowners asking them if someone were to rent your home today, how much do you think it would rent for monthly, unfurnished, and without utilities? The first problem here should be obvious. This data is collected based on guesses that homeowners are making. It is not necessarily reflective of the true value. But the fact that it's measuring value at all is a problem. CPI is measuring a cost that no one is actually paying. This type of measurement may be useful in something that attempts to measure the value of the US economy, but it is no place in an inflation index that is supposed to represent household expenditures. This is problematic when monetary policy is being decided by this index, and it's why most other countries don't include housing data and inflation measures, at least not when making monetary policy. But what's relevant now is that this is a third way CPI overestimates inflation. Listen, no measure of inflation is perfect. There are good reasons to use CPI in some contexts. We don't have time to go into the specifics of every way to measure inflation. What's important to understand here is that CPI is generally going to give you the highest measure of inflation out of any given index. It's also important to know that the effects of any given deflator has on either overstating or understating inflation increases the further from the base year you get, so drawing conclusions over long periods is especially hard. Now you should have part of the picture as to why charts like these, which deflate hourly compensation with CPI, show wage stagnation. But this is only the first part of the picture. In fact, one of the charts I showed you actually has charts using the Personal Consumption Expenditure, or PCE, as a deflator instead of CPI showing that, quote, using July 1990 as the base period, average real wages using the CPI grew 21% over the three-decade period ending in February 2022. Real wages grew by 39% using the PCE. The Cato Institute likewise observes, quote, with the average 1967 to 1970 as an index base of 100, by 2017, prices rose to an index of 603.7 in the CPI, but only to 540.2 in the PCE. Cumulative inflation over this period was thus about 12% higher in the CPI than it was in the PCE. So while growth is certainly higher with alternative deflators, it still shows some signs of stagnation. But as alluded to earlier, this is only part of the picture. Measuring hourly earnings itself can be misguided and paint a misleading picture of stagnation. This is largely because there has been an increase in non-wage benefits given to workers in the past decades. It's become increasingly common for employees to provide benefits like health care to workers or to contribute to retirement savings. The Cato Institute shows that including these benefits and using the preferred PCE deflator doesn't show the same type of stagnation. They also use similar methods to show that real median household income rather than just hourly compensation also has not stagnated when using PCE as a deflator and adjusting for smaller household sizes. They then proposed a better method for measuring how well Americans are doing. Focusing on time prices, which measure how many hours people must work on average to acquire goods, the percentage of income spent on necessities, and a share of households making over $100,000 a year, measured in 2021 dollars. In a fixed basket of consumer goods, the average hours worked to afford these goods fell by over 72% between 1979 and 2019. And from the 1970s to the 2010s, the share of spending on necessities dropped from over 25% to just 13.5%. From 1979 to 1921, the share of households earning less than $35,000 a year shrunk from 30.3% to 25.2%. The share of households earning between $35,000 and $100,000 a year also shrunk from 49 to 39%. The share of households earning more than $100,000 a year increased from 20.6% to 35.8%. 
So the middle class has gotten smaller, but only because Americans are getting richer. Considering these facts, is it really fair to say that the middle class is stagnant or worse off than it used to be? I want to be clear in saying I'm not interested in trying to sell the idea that everyone is doing great or that there aren't valid concerns about the ability of newer generations to grow wealth, especially through home ownership. I plan on making an entire podcast episode dedicated to the 2008 crisis and its unnecessarily slow recovery. But for now, it will suffice to say that the lack of effective stimulus after 2008 certainly did have long-lasting effects on millennials in particular. Many of these were not fully rectified until the COVID-19 stimulus, giving us a plethora of so-called frying pan charts showing growth below trend after 2008, only to return after the COVID stimulus. But these questions are complicated. It is difficult to get clear answers, and we should be careful not to generalize so as not to convince ourselves that millennials and Gen Z's fate is somehow innately going to be worse than their parents. In fact, it is already clear that this is not the case. Real generational wealth per capita is now over twice as high for millennials and Gen Z as it was for Gen X. We do not have data back far enough for the boomers, but we have every indication that we're on track to outdo them. You can see something similar in the average household income of people aged 25 to 34 and 35 to 44. As we would expect, there is a dip in a slow recovery in 2008, but it is now higher than it ever has been. Homeownership is one area where I will side with my fellow Gen Zers and millennials. To this day, millennials are still tracking behind when it comes to homeownership. 62% of 40-year-olds, some of the oldest millennials, own their homes in 2022, compared with 69% of baby boomers when they were 40 and 64% of Gen Xers when they were 40. Gen Z, however, appears to be on track for the time being. How long this will last is unclear since Gen Z has only just started to buy homes during a time of low mortgage rates in 2020 and 2021. Where I will champion my generational cause is condemning the empty nest boomers who refuse to downsize. Baby boomers with no kids own 28% of the nation's three-bedroom plus homes, while millennials with kids own just 14%. Baby boomers are in a very real sense landlords refusing to rent their homes to tenants to keep prices artificially high. It is understandable why they would do it, however frustrating it may be. Ultimately, this is a problem of incentives. Hopefully, Biden's new tax credits to both people buying and selling homes will incentivize boomers to finally downsize, middle-aged people to move out of small starter homes, freeing them up to younger people, and enable said younger people to afford buying a home. Another claim that is thrown around a lot is that X percent of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, which was mentioned at the end of the text messages. The recent number sparking Twitter fights was 78%, although it is more common to hear around 40% to 60% since 78% will strike people as obviously absurd. Thankfully, the tweet has now been community noted to better reflect real data. Firstly, paycheck to paycheck is not a well-defined economic concept. This is why it is not ever measured in large academic or government surveys. Instead, it is measured in surveys done by marketing companies asking Americans how they feel. For example, the most recent survey that came up with the 78% number was done by payroll.org. Federal Reserve studies paint a different picture. They showed a median American has a net worth of $192,000. The median American household holds $8,000 in transaction accounts, which are checkings and savings accounts, and 54% of adults have some cash savings that could pay for three months of expenses. So by any reasonable definition, at least those 54% of Americans with three months of expenses saved should not be considered living paycheck to paycheck. Frequent Twitter users will recognize that I am quoting Matt Darling, who frequently takes on the Sisyphusian task of refuting these studies with more accurate data. Although not mentioned in the text messages, the claim that around 40% of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency expense seems relevant after mentioning Matt Darling, for this is another claim he buries the burden of refuting. The claim comes from a Federal Reserve survey that asks Americans if they would choose to cover a $400 emergency expense with cash. 63% of Americans say that they would pay with cash or cash equivalent, and that number has been trending upwards for years. Again, the median American household holds $8,000 in transaction accounts, so the median American can certainly afford this expense. I want to conclude by reiterating, there are major problems in American society, especially with wealth distribution and how we treat our poor. Even if only 10% of Americans could not afford a $400 emergency expense, that is unacceptable in a society where that expense would come from a ride in an ambulance. And that becomes even more unacceptable when you remember that we are one of the richest places in the world where CEOs are earning 300 times out of their employees. But for the most part, the world is getting better. We are getting richer, which allows us to rectify these failures more easily and to create a better life for everyone. 
Data is complicated, and we should be wary about drawing overgeneralized conclusions, especially when those conclusions are that we are doomed. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I know that some of it might have been a little dense, um, but I hope you enjoyed it. I've been getting more support recently than I ever had before. It's great to be able to read the comments or my live stream chat and recognize the names of returning viewers. I'll be streaming more soon, so subscribe here for that. I usually start around 3 or 4 p.m. and I'll go tell whenever I fall asleep, usually at like 2 a.m. All of my sources will be linked below, and I highly encourage you to read through the Cato Institute studies if you found this podcast interesting. I try to keep it short, both because I know people can't tolerate this kind of stuff for that long and because i'm still working on my lifelong stutter um but you know what i think i've been getting better recently okay so thank you everybody for watching i uh hope you'll enjoy the next one goodbye mm -hmm.